alaikum. Hope everybody's doing well today. Have you been enjoying the convention so far? I'm going to take that as a yes, alhamdulillah. My name is Lena Safah, and I am the Marketing Communications Director for Muslim American Society, but tonight I am honored to be your talk show host. Has anybody attended the talk show so far at this uh, convention? Hands up. I can't see you guys. All right. So today's talk show is going to be very interesting, inshallah, and it is the last talk show for this convention 2018. Today's talk show is Muslim community dealing with homosexuality. With the fast-growing homosexual movement and its societal empowerment, many intuitive questions are jumping to the minds of the Muslim community. What should the ones battling against homosexual feelings do? Can those having homosexual feelings still be Muslims? How about those practicing? Can they still be Muslims? How should we, as a Muslim community, deal with homosexuality? I'm not going to answer that question for you, but I have three wonderful panelists who will be doing that, inshallah. First and foremost, I would like to invite Sister Susie Ismail. Sister Susie Ismail is the founder and head of communications at Cornerstone Counseling. She's the author of several books and a counselor at private schools in New Jersey. She has three wonderful kids and is always a joy to listen to. Please help me welcome Sister Susie Ismail. Next, I would like to welcome a personal favorite and a dear sister of mine, Sister Lubna Mullah. Sister Lubna Mullah was born to Egyptian parents. She was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. She moved to Egypt for three years with her husband, Sheikh Suhail Mullah and her children where she studied Arabic, Quranic recitation, and Islamic studies before moving back to the United States. She worked for the Muslim American Society as our National Tarbiya Director and was an absolute joy to work with, alhamdulillah. She writes for myvirtualmosque.com. She has a Master's of Fine Arts in Screenwriting and one of the best mentors I have ever seen. Please give a round of applause for my dear sister, Lubna Mullah. My last guest for today is an up-and-coming powerhouse in the Chicago community. Omar Hadruj was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan and raised in Chicago. He attended the Islamic Foundation School in Villa Park and then graduated from Benedictine University on a pre-med track. Pre-med, mashallah. While in high school and college, he had the opportunity to study the Islamic sciences under various local scholars. While in college, he was accepted as a scholarship student at the Islamic University of Medina, he completed an associate's degree in the Arabic language and a bachelor's degree from the College of Sharia, graduating with the highest honors from the Faculty of Islamic Law. While in Medina, he also attended classes at the Prophet's Mosque studying the various Islamic sciences and recently moved back to Chicago, where he currently serves as a full-time youth director at the Islamic Cir uh, Center of Naperville. Please help me welcome Brother Omar Hadruj. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Does everybody have their microphones ready? Yes, they do. So my first question to you is, why is this talk show not named after me? It should be. You, that's it. I, I, you know, instead of like a mass talk show, I really think it should be late afternoon with Lana. What do you guys think? Tell us, See, I already, I already have my fan base. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, so let's delve right into it, inshallah. We all knew coming in that this would be a very sensitive topic within the Muslim community. And my first question is a very straight question. I want to ask all three of you, and I know that all three of you are mentors, and you also work with the youth and the Muslim community at large. So my question to you is, is homosexuality in itself a sin, or is being homosexual a sin? What's the distinction between having a homosexual identity or feeling like you're attracted to somebody of the same gender or homosexuality in and of itself. Susie, can we start with you? Yes, of course, yes. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim. 
So I'm thrilled to be on the late night show with Lena. This is what we're calling it now, right? The late afternoon <laughs> show. Late afternoon show with Lena, yes, okay. I'm thrilled to be a guest on your show, Lena. Um, I think this is an incredibly important topic and I think the question is a very relevant one and one that's a great way to kind of kickstart this conversation. So it has only been in the most recent decades, about the past two decades, that we have equated a sexuality or a preference in terms of sexual orientation with an identity. Words matter. Words matter because they essentially shape how we view our world. According to the theory of sociolinguistic relativity, which is a very fancy way of saying our words often create the way we view the world and give the world meaning. Now when we look at the Quran, we see that in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distinguishes between the creation of human beings and the creation of angels. How? By teaching Adam alayhi salam the names of things. Because the words themselves can help shape our reality. So when we began to shift the terminology of using the word homosexual to be an identity or pansexual or demisexual, to take a desire or a sense of feeling some sort of attraction into a label, we created a reality that misinterprets an action. So the idea of standing up and saying, I am a homosexual, is very different than saying, I find myself attracted to those of the same gender. It's very different from saying, I act upon that attraction. Because when we create a label, it becomes a part of a person. But when we differentiate between a label and an action, then we can discuss the action without fearing the harm of the person. Because you and I and everyone here and the creation of Allah is so much more than a label. We're so much more than our sexuality. Why has society chosen to force us to define ourselves by something that is related to an action rather than an identity? Lubna, I see you agreeing with your beautiful, usual smile. Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I just wanted to add to that, that um, as Dr. Susie mentioned, so if somebody has a desire, and let's look at it in a general perspective. If somebody has a desire, whether that be for another person, regardless of their gender, if they have a desire to overeat food, if they have a desire for alcohol, they have a desire for drugs, all of those are desires, or a desire to punch a hole through the wall where they're angry, right? Sometimes th those are all things that are natural, but they have to be controlled in a way. So if somebody has a desire, for example, for food, I was, I think a year ago, and I'm still a recovering food addict, but that was a strong desire of mine. We all are, I think. <laughs> I am truly, Coffee addict. <laughs> so am I now going to say that Allah SWT doesn't love me because I have this strong desire for food? You know, and, and I'm simplifying it this way because we have to look at it that way. So in the same way, if somebody has same-sex attraction and they have the desire to act upon it, and yet they don't, it is not blameworthy on them. As a matter of fact, they are, inhib they are exhibiting that level of self-control that Allah SWT wishes from us, but it's acting upon that. It's acting upon that sexual desire, which would be, uh, which would be considered as zina. Any, any, any type of sexual relation outside of between a man and a woman outside of marriage would be considered zina. So acting upon that would be blameworthy. Having those desires or feelings or thoughts would not be. So let's make it a little bit more personal. Ahmed, I know that you deal with the youth constantly. And anybody here from Naperville? We're creating a fan base. So I know that, mashallah, you work with a lot of youth. And I know that many people in the Muslim community think that the Muslim community does not struggle with homosexuality. 
So we view, to a large extent, that homosexuality is something outside of the Muslim community. So I want to start with you, Ahmed, especially with the youth. What has your experience been? I know that if I speak to Lubna from a mentorship perspective, or Susie from a counseling perspective, that they might have different perspectives because they deal with different age groups. But I want to know from your perspective, what age group do you deal with primarily, and what has your experience been with homosexuality in the Muslim community? Yeah, Bismillah. So thank you uh, for those answers, and Sister Lana. Um, you know, with the youth in particular, so I deal with middle school, high school, college, starting to get gray hairs from some of those categories of people. I'm not going to say which one. But, you know, growing up here, I grew up here, alhamdulillah, we are, uh, you know, we experience all of the same desires. We experience all of the same hardships, the same difficulties as anyone else growing up here. So a lot of times there's this understanding or this idea that we're insulated from something like homosexuality but in the time that I've been a youth director and been around high school college age youth I've seen this is a reality and I've dealt with you know people who are working with us you know practicing brothers and sisters who are struggling number one with this aspect of their identity, these feelings, like that they don't know, does this define who I am if I'm attracted to the same gender? And they recognize that the action, like Sister Lubna said, is what's wrong. And so they are struggling, they're trying to figure out, okay, so what can I do, what can't I do? So it is a reality. And I've seen also when a person is kind of shunned away or made to feel like this defines who they are and because of that they're sick or evil or whatever it is it has a tremendous effect on their psyche and to the extent that I know someone even who's dealing with uh, a relative who's no longer a practicing Muslim they don't consider themselves practicing because they feel that this is their identity having same-sex attraction and they're not welcomed by their own family, they're not welcomed by the community, so they kind of turn away altogether from the community and even from Islam. Is it a lack of acceptance within the community or do they feel that their feelings contradict with the teachings of Islam? Do they feel that their very feelings constitute a sin? Or is it because community at large does not differentiate between the feelings and the action? It's definitely a little bit of both. It's definitely a little bit of both because as a community, we also have to be able to recognize just what Sister Susie and Sister Lubna mentioned, which is that a feeling doesn't define who you are. A desire doesn't define who you are. One of the most beautiful and effective things that I tell people who may be struggling with this desire is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't judge us based off of a feeling or desire. He judges us based off of our actions. And in fact, if a person has a desire, that goes against something that is in Islam that they and they don't act on it, you know, withholding themselves or stopping themselves for the sake of Allah, then that person actually is rewarded for that. So that person who's struggling and the more difficult the struggle is, the more rewarding it can be for them. So not only can that person be a practicing Muslim who's struggling with what they feel these urges are, but they can actually be a much better Muslim than someone who isn't struggling with that. That's a very interesting point. Now my critical question is, what age group really gave you the gray hairs? High school. High school. <laughs> Definitely high school. <laughs> and you have high schoolers? And you have high schoolers? And I have an almost high schooler. The best thing, does anybody know what the best thing about hijab is? It doesn't show the gray hairs. It's just the guys who show the gray hairs. Age on us doesn't show them on the other hand. But um, you said something, Ahmed, very important about the psyche. So going back to the mental and emotional state, Susie, I know that you have several centers in New Jersey, Cornerstone Counseling, and I know that you deal with family issues, marital issues. I'm sure many of our wonderful audience members have attended those sessions of yours. And for the most part, you seem to focus at the conventions on the marital aspect. So my question to you is, 
Number one, from a family perspective, what is the impact that you see? And number two, from a personal perspective, walk us through the emotional and mental state of somebody who is struggling with homosexual feelings or homosexual identity struggles. So they're both great questions, and I think it's, you know, it has to be addressed in two separate parts. First of all, from the family perspective. For the parents who have a child who comes to them and says, mom, dad, I think I'm gay. I think I'm demisexual. I think I'm pansexual. I think I'm, and fill in the blank with whatever they are identifying with. For the parents who hear that, one, don't freak out. <laughs> Although I know that's the natural reaction. <laughs> okay? Think of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was approached by the young man who came to him and said, I want to commit zina, I want to fornicate. And his reaction when the Sahaba got upset that he would identify an action that clearly lay outside the realm of Islam. And his response to the Sahaba who got upset was like this, to wait, to hold on. And he responded to the young man kindly, empathetically, he asked him, is this something you would want someone to do to your mother? And the man said, no. He said, would you want him to do it to your sister? He said, no. Would you want someone to do this to your future daughter? Again, he said, no. And so the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his approach to a young man who came and spoke to him of something that was outside the realm of Islam, he spoke to him of a desire. He reacted it to it with empathy, with understanding, but also with reasoning, with rationale. And the final step was the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam placed his hand on the heart of the young man and made sincere dua that Allah would remove this desire from his heart. So parents, when your child comes to you, either you know, straight up tells you these words, or you find a note that's written, you see emails that were exchanged, you read a text message, or somehow you begin to understand the struggle your child is going through, don't freak out. First, be grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened this pathway of dialogue, that your child now has an outlet and can speak about what they are struggling with, can tell you this is what I feel and I don't know what to do with my feelings. Because the worst thing that can happen in a family is that when a child speaks of the desire that they're feeling or the struggle that they have, for that child to be turned away by their own family. It's enough that if they go online, they'll find communities of people who react with harshness, that within their own family, which should be the seat of security, they don't need to have that same harshness. So number two, for the person themselves who is struggling with these emotions, with these feelings, first again, separate the identity from the emotion, from the action. The desire exists. And we do have to acknowledge that the desire exists. But there are so many desires that exist within us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us again as creatures that differ from the malaika, from the angels, and from the jinn. In that within each of us, we have levels of nafs. We have the nafs al-ammara, which is our basis self, which says, if you have a desire, act upon it. And that nafs al-ammara is the self that is most commonly pushed upon us by the marketing, by the media, by the music, by the books. Be you, feed your desires. And yet we know that that is the lowest sense of self. And even from a psychological standpoint, if we look at the id, the ego, and the superego, we see it equated very similar to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us in terms of the nafs. Because along with the nafs al-ammara, there exists within us a nafs al-lawama, the conscience self. The self that says, I know you feel this way. I know you want to do something that lies outside the sphere of Islam. But it's not something you should do. The benefit or the brief moments of pleasure you may gain in dunya are not worth losing your akhirah for. And then finally, the highest level, the nafs al-mutma'inna, the contented self. When we get to that place where we say, I understand that I have this desire, but I am grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed me to recognize that this desire is not beneficial, and I am content to stay away from this desire and not to act upon it. So, 
You can clap. I promise I want to clap every time I hear her talk. So I want to ask all three of you by a show of hands, how many situations or have you ever seen a situation where uh, a youth or a person, doesn't have to be a youth, was rejected outwardly by their family for having homosexual tendencies? By a show of hands, has anybody ever dealt with a situation like that? Yes or no? No, no. <laughs> no. Okay. Amar, you have. Susie, you have. Okay. So I'm going to ask both of you, and Lubna, I want you to also, as if somebody had come to you in that situation, I want to hear realistically what has your advice been to the youth or to the person who is dealing with this issue? So obviously at this point they have their internal struggle and then they have this external struggle. Like you said, our family is our first source of support. It's our safety net. And so what do you do? How do you advise somebody who's dealing with their internal struggle already and then their family rejects them, kicks them out, tells them go be with the person that you chose over us, that you chose over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to hell, this, that, and the other thing. What is your advice to the person themselves? And then my other question is, the second part of it is, what would you, so we heard your advice about how parents should not freak out. I'm a parent, I always freak out, my kids are in the crowd, please do not put me on, uh, on the spot. But for parents who already have freaked out, you know, again, our initial reaction as parents, my kid comes and they want to like dye their hair blue. It's like, what are you doing? This is against our culture. This is against our... So if parents have already freaked out like that, what do you advise them? The, the damage has already been done. What's your advice on moving on? How do we heal as a family? Okay, so I think the second one, Dr. Susie can take, inshallah. Um, the advice to the person themselves, besides what we mentioned about how we're separating the identity from the urge and from the desire, but when now they're dealing with their family rejecting them, is to bring them that comfort of the family may be upset or rejecting you or acting in a rash way because they don't understand. They don't understand fully what we've just been talking about, that this is not something that defines who you are, this is not something that has made you, you know, someone who is an outcast. This is, like we've all talked about, we all have desires, we all sin, right? And the way, and I, I love how Dr. Susie mentioned it, how the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with people who were struggling with sin. Amazing, amazing. And if we just focused on that, and if we understood how merciful he was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never to condone the actual sin, but to make people realize that they were never outside of the possibility of forgiveness or outside of the mercy of Allah. So hating the action, not hating the person. Exactly. And so when a person realizes that, that maybe this is why their parents reacted in that way, and it's painful, there's no doubt, or their family, and it's something natural, you're going to feel hurt and maybe even act out as a result of that. But for them to realize that in that moment of their parents acting or their family acting in that way, they still have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They still are not outside of that mercy where they can't, you know, if they're, for example just dealing with the urge and like we said I mean they may even be rewarded in kind of fighting that urge and if they're practicing it and they recognize that it's a sin still so they, they it's like I'm, I'm weak it's a weakness again we're not condoning that but we're dealing with them like how we deal with anyone who is a sinner right as long as they're trying to get help as long as they recognize that this is a mistake that this is not something they should be acting upon and that door of redemption, that door of coming back to Allah is always open. So making a person realize that when they feel like they have no one, even when they feel maybe even that they don't have their family, they still always have Allah. So I think one of the bigger issues is that we as a community have a hard time accepting that part of being a human is sinning, right? So nobody besides the Prophet والسلام, was perfect and we are all sinners, right? And the best of us are the people who repent, correct? So I think that as a community, we struggle with the idea that, you know, people sin. 
it happens, and just because somebody sins, again, we struggle with hating the action as opposed to hating the person. But I want to bring it back to what I was asking early about, okay, what if we already, as a family, hated the person or rejected the person? And again, I mean, this is not the only situation where a family will reject their child. So, you know, we're as, as extreme as if you marry the wrong person, you can go and live with that person. You preferred your person over me, right? Uh, if in some, in some families, if a girl doesn't wear hijab, if a boy doesn't do this or that. So my question to you is then, as a family, you've already done some damage. As parents, we're not perfect. We've reacted like humans. How do we heal? How do we come back from that? Okay, so that's a beautiful question as well. And you know, when we look to the Quran and we understand the importance of Silat al-Rahim, the connection of the womb, it is one of the most difficult relationships to maintain. And this is why in the Quran, we as children are reminded to not say uffa to our parents. In Surah Al-Isra, we as children are reminded to lower the wing of humility to our parents. But in the Quran, as parents, we are also reminded of the responsibility that we have towards our children who are an amana, a trust. That they are an adornment of our life as we see in Surah Al-Kahf. So the responsibility goes both ways. But because family relationships are hard, and this is not just in the Muslim community, you know, if you turn on any of the Hallmark movies, you know, in the 25 days of Christmas, there's always some kind of family drama going on. So difficulty exists within family. And when someone feels that their family can't understand them, when someone is exhibiting that internal struggle and that struggle is compounded by the external struggle of the family, just as I told the parents, don't freak out, I will tell the children, don't give up. Because at the end of the day, what your parents are exhibiting, pushing you away, maybe treating you in a way that goes against what we have talked about from the Islamic perspective of that rahmah, that compassion and that mercy. It comes from a place where they themselves are struggling to understand, where they're trying to figure out what to do next. So for the child who is struggling in this family relation, reach out to a counselor. Reach out to someone, and I know I'm biased in terms of that, but I can't stress that enough. Reach out to someone in the community, an imam, a mentor, someone that you know, because with difficulties like these, it can be really hard for you to engage with your parents one-on-one. -on -one. There needs to be that third party that can get involved. Bring that third party in and then begin healing together. So real quick, Susie, I just want to ask you from a very clinical perspective. What are the mental health struggles that people dealing with um, a homosexual identity struggles deal with as well? Because I think that as a community as well, we, we don't um, acknowledge a lot of times that a lot of personal struggles also come with mental illness struggles. The personal struggles lead to mental illness struggles. And unfortunately, as a community and as parents, we don't realize this until it's too late. And unfortunately, sometimes too late is way too late. So I just want to ask real briefly, from a clinical perspective, what have you seen with homosexual struggle? What other clinical implications are there? So across the board, you know, issues of identity, whether it is sexual identity, religious identity, um, gender dysphoria, for example, issues of identity can cause severe mental illnesses and struggles that include issues of self-harm, issues of, you know, viewing yourself in a way where you question who you are to a point where it begins to affect the mental perspective of the self-concept. And so what we're seeing is, of course, increased incidences of depression. We are seeing increased anxiety, increased panic disorders, which is giving way to bipolar disorders, manic depressive episodes. And these are all linked, again, and I don't want to link it just to the element of sexuality, because identity is so much more than that. And many times when someone begins to identify as a homosexual, and just briefly, you know, I'll give an example. We often have children as young as 11 and 12 years old in our cornerstone offices identifying as homosexual, pansexual, demisexual. When we ask them, do you know what sex is? Do you even know what that entails? Most of the time they have no idea. 
but the because they feel ostracized from their community, because they feel they don't fit in, they're seeking an identity that can give them meaning. And that in itself can cause severe mental health difficulties. Lubna, how are you, my dear? I'm doing great, thank you. <laughs> so, Lubna, I know that you work with communities a lot. I know that you travel all over and you deal with a lot of people and you also write for myvirtualmoss.com. I know that you don't like being called a religious authority. However, I know that a lot of people do come to you for religious uh, advice. So, I guess my question to you is this. Well, it's a twofold question. My first question to you is, as a community, homosexuality aside, how, what would you advise us as a Muslim community? How do you advise us to look at sin and sinners? And how do we move from blame and guilt to compassion, like Susie mentioned about the Prophet والسلام, and assistance? How can we really be in assistance of our brothers and sisters? So the first part, I think you, were, uh, you said, how can we move away from... Blame and guilt. Blame and guilt to support and assistance. Yes, JazakAllah Khairan. Um, you know, when we take that approach, as Dr. Susie has mentioned, that of compassion, and we're able to, to turn the mirror onto ourselves, and like as you say, we say, Kulli ben Adam khata, all uh, sons of Adam, all human beings are sinners, and the best of those are the ones that repent. So to say which sin is more acceptable or less shameful or what have you, I mean, that's, we're fooling ourselves. Uh, I literally had somebody overseas in Europe say, he's like, we're really bad over here, to be honest. He said this, Muslim. And he says, to be honest, I'd rather have my daughter keep on her, her hijab and not pray than the other way around. I was like, yeah, that is pretty messed up. In other words, we choose which sins kind of are more acceptable in the community and not. Like I'll drink alcohol, but I don't eat pork? Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right? Um, so, so when we have that understanding that, look, we're not here to start talking about which family has this musibah, which family has this calamity, and what are they struggling with, that, I think that also exemplifies the problem. Number one, what type of sin looks better? But number two, what exacerbates that is this whole idea of, oh, what are people going to say about our family? And that's one of the reasons I feel people want to just kind of push them away. They want to disassociate themselves with that son or daughter that has gone astray in whichever form that may be. Uh, somebody even asked earlier, can we disown my child for not praying? So what about homosexuality, right? So we all have these underlying problems when, uh, uh, where, we, where we worry so much about what people are going to think that we're willing to break our own, our own home. And that is the basis. And, and, and don't forget for a second that if you are ostracizing one member of the family, your kids are going to be brokenhearted about that. Their siblings are brokenhearted about that. There may be one parent that doesn't agree with ostracizing, you know, uh, uh, this type of action. So taking that to a community level, we need to be careful when we give khutbas, when we give lectures, that we're not condemning people for their behavior, but we condemn the behavior and provide alternatives. And I think that's the key to it, right? How do we have these open, uh, welcoming type of discussions, uh, welcoming type of khutbas, where we address issues, but we don't sit there and yell and blame and, and, and really guilt people for what they're going through. So now that he talked about khutbas, you can clap. Everyone want to clap? We encourage it. You don't understand, sitting up here, the light is right in our face. So I can't tell if you're clapping, if you're booing. Well, I could tell if you're booing. I can't tell if you're sleeping. Can you tell if they're snoring? Are you guys still awake? They're not awake. These people in the middle are not awake. You guys are over there. So, going back to the issue of khutbas, I have a delicate question for you. And any one of you feel free to jump in. Again, I feel like a lot of the rhetoric that non-Muslims and people who would like to attack Islam use against us stems from our own rhetoric. So yes, a lot of times it comes from taking verses or hadith out of context or taking a part of a verse and we know this very well we've seen it like uh, kill them wherever you see them but there's a whole context of that you know of war and how that was and a whole verse that they cut that out of but then there are also issues of hadith 
issues of weak narration, hadith, fabricated hadith, or hadith taken out of context. So one of the hadith that uh, Islamophobes used to um, attack Islam and Muslims, especially on the issue of homosexuality, is the punishment of homosexual activity. So what is Lubna, I would like to ask you particularly, starting with Lubna, and then perhaps all he's looking at me like, oh, you're going there. Yes, I'm going there. What is, your, what is your opinion on the validity of this hadith and Islam's stance in general on punishing homosexuality and homosexuals? I'll be very honest, Sister Lena. We were having a very awesome discussion backstage, and I'm going to defer to Dr. Susie Hamdaji. I really loved her answer and, uh, and Brother Omar, honestly. But we'll all add as I see. You know, but that I, initial question, I'll give to her. She had this a better. Is, <laughs> this, this is the second time Susan's been asked a question about punishment today. This morning, I moderated her session, and they were asking her about beating of wives. So now we're asking her about, Susie, it seems like you're the go-to punishment person today. So. <laughs> no, I think, I think, <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. She put her mic down. That's how far she's not touching this question. Well, I, I think the importance then, this is what we were discussing behind the, uh, the stage earlier, is that many times we focus on certain verses of the Qur'an, as Sister Lana was saying, or certain ahadith, and we try to understand them in a vacuum. So before responding to the specific element, I do think we need to understand that when we talk about tafsir al-Qur'an, or when we look at the ahadith, there is a reason why in our Islamic heritage, in our deen, the isnad of the hadith is so critical. Who narrated it and to whom was it narrated and if there is even an inkling of doubt or a possibility of question about one of the per people who narrated it that hadith is rejected and so when we look at tafsir al-quran we also know that the understanding of the quran there are two ways to approach it there is a way which is called mu'athir, which is you're, you're essentially taking the, the athar of wh what is the context, where was this first revealed, how was it revealed, what was it surrounding. And there is tafsir bil-ra'i, which requires ijtihad, a tafsir of opinion that requires an intense understanding and many, many elements of being able to qualify to provide tafsir bil-ra'i, which is with the ijtihad. And there's a bit of a third type of tafsir that we see today. And that's tafsir from, I think I know what I'm talking about because I went to Sheikh Google and so now I am qualified to provide this tafsir. Okay? This is not the tafsir we want. <laughs> and so when we... Okay, Google. <laughs> so when we look at a, a, the narration or, or uh, an element of had, when we're looking at punishment and what that had means from an Islamic perspective, we first defer to the basic sense or the essence of Islam, which is our deen is a deen of Rahmah. Our creator is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the most compassionate. And yet the understanding of the had is that it is very difficult to mete out a punishment because of the requirements of the four witnesses and the four witnesses must have witnessed it firsthand and seen it and there is this and this and this. And we talked about two examples of situations that have authentic narrations of them. And the first was the narration of the prostitute who the Rasul sallallahu said, this woman is a prostitute. So it is known that she has committed, you know, that zina outside of the marital relationship. And yet he says she has promised Jannah because there was a point at which there was a thirsty dog. And she took her leather sock out, her, her boot off, and put water in it and allowed the dog to drink. So that is mercy. That is compassion. And we see the example of the woman who came to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam carrying a child and said, I have committed zina. And so I want the had, the punishment of this dunya rather than the punishment of the akhirah. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, go and give birth to your child. And she went and nine months later after she had given birth to a child, she came back to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, I have given birth to the child and now I want my punishment, I want my had. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, go and nurse your child for a period of two years. And then, and then. And so this is Rahmah. 
So when we talk about a narration where the isnad itself may not be a strong isnad, but we understand that as there is a had, a punishment that we are advised of, we must also look at it through the Islamic lens, not through Sheikh Google, not through answering Islam.com. Instead, we understand it contextually, we understand it with the Quran, and we look at the ijtihad that has done, been done before us to understand it. I want to definitely add to those categories of who not to listen to is not to listen to people who seek to tarnish the reputation of Islam by taking what we have and then changing it and giving it back to us. And I feel like that's the unfortunate reality that we deal with, especially when we are dealing with youth. And I know many, many centers and uh, masajid and youth gatherings that want to address the topic of homosexuality, but it's too taboo. They don't want to go near it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to encourage it. Like talking about it is encouraging it. Right? So if we have an issue in the Muslim community, it's encouraged and highly encouraged to address and talk about it so that we do get the correct information. And this goes for anything that we consider taboo, whether it's homosexuality or drugs or sex or any issues that, you know, we're told from a very young age, I don't, you know, don't talk, this is inappropriate, don't talk about it. But then people go to their friends and their peers and like you said, Sheikh Google, to, or, or people who are not, Muslim, and again, there's a lot of knowledge to gain from non-Muslims, and that's an absolute reality. We live here, we are American, we go to school, but when it comes to Islamic knowledge, seek it from the correct sources. Go to people. We have to be the kind of community that encourages two-way communications. I encourage you to come to me and ask me if I have the knowledge, and if I have the knowledge, I have to bring it to you before you even ask me. And that's the only way to make sure that our up-and-coming generation have the correct information. Now, I get one person. <laughs> so I want to shift a little bit. So we dealt with the topic of people who have homosexual feelings and how the community um, should deal and how the parents should deal and how they themselves should look at their own struggle. Now my question to you is the following. We have a whole big part of the community that doesn't know themselves how to deal with the whole issue of human rights, the human rights of um, the LGBTQ community. So uh, Pew Research run in 2017 actually said that 52% of American Muslims um, are more accepting of homosexuality than even white evangelicals. So we've surpassed white evan evan evangelicals in accepting homosexuality, and that's up 25 percentage points from 2007. So in 10 years, the acceptance of homosexuality as a concept, or in, as homosexuality in the community has gone up. So my first question is, what do you think the factors are that led to this acceptance? And I want to ask, I want to start with Ahmed. What do you think the factors are that make a Muslim say, fully knowing that, you know, the act of homosexuality is a sin or unacceptable in Islam. What makes a Muslim say, you know, when somebody get, I get a call from Pew Research, they never call me, but you know, somebody calls me from Pew Research Center, and like, hey, you know, you're an American Muslim, yes I am. Okay, how do you feel about homosexuality? It's fine, it's, I'm okay with it in the community. Why would I say that? So I think there's a lot of different factors. I think sometimes the way it's framed, right, in popular culture and the way that things are, it's like, you know, the, all those hashtags, love wins and the rainbow and who doesn't love a rainbow, right? So all those things make it seem like if you don't support the lifestyle, if you are not actively uh, part of the movement, then you are uh, homophobic, you're a bigot, you are full of hates. And I think, you know, and kind of also even to touch on the last thing that we mentioned, more so than being able to respond to Islamophobes, it's very important for us to be able to insulate ourselves to have that level of comfort in knowing that, like what was mentioned, that our deen is a deen of mercy and that whatever Allah tells us that is good for us is good for us because it's good for us. And whatever He tells us to stay away from, it's because it's harmful for us. And so if we can be able to accept that and find comfort in that by learning and understanding the deen 
and the way that Allah has given this to us is so beautiful, then I think we would be less likely to jump on, you know, just whatever the popular opinion is for that day and just be confident in knowing that, like what we said, we're differentiating between, we're not saying you hate the person and that means this person deserves no rights or anything like that, but that we disagree with this lifestyle, right? With the actual action and with the lifestyle that is part of the action. And we know that, you know, that that's our rights to be able to, to be able to disagree with the moral lifestyle. Everyone has, you know, uh, a line, right? And we say the only difference is that our line for us is drawn by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. So, so let me give you a scenario. I'm on social media. We're all on social media. I go on Facebook. I am checking my news feed. I see lots and lots of memes. Uh, I see lots of invitations to events. And then I see that somebody in the Midwest or the South or wherever was beaten within an inch of their life because they are gay or perceived to be gay. I want to comment and I want to share this and say, hey guys, this is inhuman. This is animalistic. This is, am I right or wrong to do that? So let me clarify. On the one hand, I want to stand up for the human rights of anybody as a Muslim, as I was, to as I was taught, social justice is part of what I should do. On the other hand, I want to be true to my religion and deep down inside somewhere, I don't want to be attacked by other Muslims. I don't want the Bismillah police on my back. So my question to all three of you is, what is your advice in this situation? As a Muslim, how far do I go in defending or do I even defend to begin with? Or do I not? So I understand that there is a limit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set for me, but before that limit, what's my approach? Um, it, the, sorry, I, the, the injustice, what was it that happened? The so example that you so gave? somebody was beaten up because they're gay or perceived to be gay. Got it, that's perfect. I got the rest, I just... Um, you know, subhanAllah, I, our deen was, was meant to be a mercy for all of mankind, right? If, if somebody is, is, is getting abused because of their actions or their behavior, uh, uh, and, it's, and in this situation, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifestyle that I don't agree with, but I would and I should stand up for the rights as a human being not to be beaten because of that. So we have to understand that part of being a Muslim is standing up for people's rights. Now, having said that, is there a difference between me standing up for uh, somebody who identifies as homosexual? Uh, if they say, you know, they're being denied work, that's their human right. That's something I would defend for them, say no, they have the right to work. They have the right to be safe in, 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 in places. They have the right to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, have all the rights of shelter and, and what have you. They should not be denied homes or loans and, 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 and so on and so forth. Now, let's be very specific. If it were to be something like, am I going to support gay marriage? Valid question. Valid question. I, I would say no. And I don't believe that we should shy away from being very clear what I support because this would do what? This is supporting something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made permissible. The marriage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines as permissible is one between a man and a woman. Outside of that, it is not permissible. So me as a Muslim, I should not feel shy. This is Allah's words. So I should not feel shy, and here's the tricky part. Right? There's always a tricky it's part. It's a tricky part. I should not feel shy to say, these are my principles. But unfortunately, because as part of the society, we're almost forced in certain things. We're almost forced uh, to accept certain principles, but we're allowed to uh, uh, be free in others. And let me give a, a, a funny example. I'm going to go back to food, guys, because to me, it's so like nobody can get mad about it. Who here loves food? Oh my God, there's so many people who do not love food. You guys aren't hungry? Come I, you on, need guys. to get out. Everybody who doesn't love food, get out. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm biased against you. Get out if you don't love food. In the 
the same way. So I, I tell this to my kids, you know, sometimes we say, should we ask if something has pork in it or if it has gelatin or whatever? I said, subhanAllah, if I said I'm vegan and I go and say, is there any meat in this? I will say, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. Right? I don't accept that for me. I don't want that. If, if a person was vegan, am I going to hate all carnivores? Do I have to go to a hot dog convention? I don't have to. So, and I'm just making a very, just kind of a simple and kind of a silly example, but by the same, it's, it's sad and it's unfortunate because yes, we have coworkers, we have schoolmates, we have your boss, it's, it's part of society. I can love you, I don't have to love your action. That's it, it's that simple. But you know, touching on that for a second, actually it's not such a, an off example because you know, if you notice now, like people are into health trends and I know that um, everybody had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Madiha speak earlier, who you are very close with, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Round of applause for Dr. Madiha. Um, and um, health is a very big trend, right? Or not a big trend, but it's a big movement right now. And so a lot of times, so I have somebody very near and dear to me who actually puts up a meme for me that says, I know you hate eating clean. Right? So it's not that, you know, so now it's like, okay, your principles is that you stay away from certain food groups because you're, um, you're, you're principled in your eating because you believe that what you eat is, you know, if you eat clean, it's better for your body. But people do view you as weird. Why are you not with us? Why are you not in the mainstream? Do you really not want this cupcake? <laughs> you know, do you really not want the tackies with cream cheese? You know who you are. I'm talking about you out there. Um, so yes, principled a lot of times is considered, um, it's demonized, right? You are principled, you are not, if you're not with us, then you're against us. And I think that's the essence of the problem, that if your principles do not align with mine, then you are against me. If you cannot agree with my actions, then you are homophobic. If you cannot agree with same-sex marriage, then you want me pushed off a cliff. You want me beaten up. You want me killed. But as Muslims, it's important to remember that Islam is a compassionate religion, that we follow the example of nobody else except the Prophet And the Prophet was a principled but compassionate man. He compromised his principles for nobody, but had compassion and mercy even for the person who threw garbage in front of his door every day and the person who threw garbage on his back every time he prayed. So we only have a few minutes left of my fabulous talk show. And I want to go around real quick and ask you your last words of advice. Practical. I think one of the things that I've always hated about conventions and beautiful talks like this, where you go out feeling like, oh my God, my Iman is so high right now. Up in the lights. What do I do with it? How, what, how do I take this to a practical level? What is my practical application? Alhamdulillah, I've had mentors my whole life that have taught me practical application. What do we do with this now? As, so I want from two perspectives, just one thing, one thing on each subject. As somebody who struggles with homosexual tendencies and as a Muslim who lives in a society where homosexuality, the acceptance of homosexual action is forced upon me. What's your advice? One and one. So I think in both cases, it is a three-step approach. Whether you're struggling with those feelings or you are trying to better understand the Islamic perspective, one, seek knowledge. Go back to the roots of our deen. Seek knowledge in the name of the Lord who has created you. So seek the knowledge with the intention of pleasing Allah. If you are struggling with these emotions, seek out what is the Islamic approach and don't go just to Google and find your path that way. Our deen is a deen which is meant to be learned at the feet of scholars. Learn from that isnad, from that tradition of learning from those who have studied and those before them that have studied. Seek out those people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put them in your path. If you are here at this convention, you have access to so many incredible individuals who have sought that knowledge and are here to transmit it. Seek them out. They will answer their emails, I promise you, maybe delayed, maybe after a little, but they will. After they, <laughs> they sleep a couple respond. of days after the convention. <laughs> they will respond, inshallah. So one, seek knowledge. 
to again follow in the footsteps of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where after he received the revelations of those opening, surah, uh, opening verses in Surah Al-Alaq he was commanded in the verses of Surah Al-Muzzammil and Surah Al-Muddathir Arise in the night or stand in the night and pray part of it connect spiritually return to the reason why you are here today the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you to be in this gathering that is inshallah surrounded by angels who spread their wings around us and say fulan fulan has been here to remember Allah and that will be written as such go back to that spiritual connection do not neglect it that dua is critical and thirdly as the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded in Surah Al-Muddathir, Ya ayyuha al-Muddathir, qum fa'andir. Arise and mourn, speak. Those who are struggling with the feelings, don't keep them inside. Speak to someone about it, someone who is knowledgeable, someone who is skilled, a counselor, a sheikh, someone who understands. And those who see it around them, I loved what both Sister Lubna and Sister Lana said, be principled, speak advise with haqq and advise with patience and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy on all of us with all of our struggles insha'Allah Lubna Amr anything to add? They're like, three, how do we three, go three second nasiha if any of you out in the audience are struggling just remember yes you are still Muslim if you have these thoughts and just because you have these thoughts you don't have to take that on as an entire identity uh, and parents, if your child comes to you uh, with the advice of Dr. Susie, don't freak out. Respond to them with rahmah and go seek help yourself so that you can know better how to deal with the situation, inshallah. inshallah. I think they covered it. The last thing that I would say is just use the Prophet ﷺ as your guide. And two of the most amazing qualities that he had that defined him was his, were his mercy and his justice. And so when you put those two together, advocate for yourself for those around you always be a source and an advocate for truth and justice wherever it is and have you know what we call compassionate orthodoxy be principled in what you believe but deal with people as a mercy I'm going to add to that, inshallah, that remember that no matter what, a lot of us feel like we've strayed so far from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember again, before you listen to yourself, before you listen to your nafs, listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, that if you walk towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He runs towards you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always waiting for us to turn back to Him. No matter what you've done, there is always a path back to Him. So even if you turn your back on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will never turn His back on you. And I think that your presence here today at this convention, in this session with these wonderful speakers is a reminder of that. Nothing happens by accident. It's all in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plans. I want to thank you for being here today. You are such a wonderful audience. Zakumallahu khairan. And thank you so much to my wonderful panelists. It was a pleasure.